I'm very happy to introduce uh, Arvind Narayanan. Uh, Arvind and I uh, have known for quite a long time. Uh, Arvind is, uh, is famous for uh, a lot of different things. Uh, his work is at the intersection of security, privacy, and policy. So for instance, he is well known for demonstrating the, the first uh, de-anonymization attack against this uh, well-known Netflix uh, data set. So this attack was like um, very well cited in the literature and it has motivated a lot of uh, the, the privacy research uh, in the community as well. Uh, and recently, Arvind has been doing a lot of very nice work in cryptocurrency. Uh, for example, he uh, actually won the first NSF award uh, on cryptocurrency. Uh, and also he uh, taught, co-taught the first MOOC uh, uh, on cryptocurrency, and he's actually also writing uh, a te textbook on cryptocurrency. Uh, so yeah, I'll give the floor to Abby. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Elaine. I have to mention that the MOOC and the textbook are also in collaboration with uh, Andrew here and a bunch of others. So it's great to be giving this talk because I specifically want to speak to an audience of, uh, a mixed audience really, of uh, people who have some background on cryptocurrencies, done some research even, as well as to computer scientists in general who don't really care about Bitcoin and uh, might not have paid a lot of attention to it. And I want to convince you that there are some very interesting ideas here that you should think about even if uh, you're not interested in cryptocurrencies per se. So this is about you know, how Bitcoin has challenged some of what we thought we knew, what are some new directions for research, both within cryptocurrencies and more generally, as well as, uh, in particular, how this brings together uh, a lot of ideas from uh, different areas of computer science. So this uh, picture here basically, to me, uh, summarizes why Bitcoin is so interesting from a research perspective. At least up until a couple of years ago, a variety of uh, academics from different disciplines, cryptography and security, uh, economics and game theory, distributed systems, had their own sort of uh, you know, traditional models for thinking about systems like Bitcoin and using those models concluded that the system cannot exist or you know, won't work, etc. And had mostly, uh, I think it's fair to say, ignored it for uh, quite a long period. Meanwhile, a lot of excitement was building in the commercial space. And now, uh, you know, uh, in the last year or two especially, it's uh, sort of reached a fever pitch with, with uh, uh, startup founders and venture capitalists talking about <coughs> Things like, oh, let's put your refrigerator on the blockchain and let's decentralize everything and how this is going to be a challenge to governments and bring down uh, you know, uh, political structures and all kinds of economic intermediaries and banks will be a thing, a thing of the past and so on. <coughs> so what is the reason for that big gap? What's in the middle? Uh, can we uh, uh, bring ideas from, uh, from both of these places together? So in this talk, I'm primarily going to focus on uh, uh, what Bitcoin uh, can tell us as researchers, right? But I've also, at other venues, uh, uh, taken a look at this side of it, and I've, been, and I've taken a more academic look to a lot of the uh, euphoria in the uh, uh, commercial space, and I've been very skeptical about a lot of the ideas around decentralization, and especially the claimed uh, political uh, and some of the social impact of it, and I'd be happy to chat more with you uh, offline if you're interested. Uh, so, you know, I'm not in either one of these camps, but it's uh, trying to reconcile those two uh, points of view together that I think can give us a lot of insights. Uh, so I just want to quickly mention that this uh, systematization of knowledge paper that we uh, recently wrote is a, is a good place to look at that also takes this point of view that we want to uh, bring together these, uh, uh, reconcile these two different points of view and generate some research insights and directions for it. And uh, Andrew Miller is also, again, one of the authors of this paper. So with that theme, I want to break down what I want to tell you today into three sort of buckets. Uh, one is, what have we learned from Bitcoin security and how I think that can in the future improve uh, security overall, both software security as well as uh, usable security, and it can have a lot of positive externalities for security. So that's one thing I want to tell you. And that comes from particular security challenges, in fact, that uh, Bitcoin play, uh, faces. It comes from a place of uh, adversity, and I, and I want to tell you how that can lead to uh, a lot of positive benefits for security. The second thing is about what Bitcoin reveals about our knowledge of game theory in particular, gaps in our knowledge of game theory and mechanism design, and how solving those challenges can have, again, positive benefits, not just in cryptocurrencies, but in a variety of uh, other areas where a particular structure that I'll point out comes up over and over again. <coughs> and then I want to tell you, you know, I'm sure you've heard a lot about how <coughs> blockchain itself Blockchains themselves use as an abstraction. Uh, you can put a lot of things on top of the blockchain, at least that's, those things are technically feasible. But I want to look at how uh, pieces of cryptocurrencies uh, uh, can be used for other applications. This one 
Um, so we're, we're writing a paper about this, and these are the three parts. But for this talk, I'll focus mostly on the first two, especially because the last one is something that uh, people may have already heard many times. So uh, these two are the things that I'm going to spend most of my time today. And at the end, I'll tell you why. If you look at some of the pieces of cryptocurrencies, try to formalize them, and try to analyze their powers and limits, uh, it reveals uh, some fascinating opportunities for bringing together uh, research from a variety of different disciplines, security programming languages, even theory and algorithms. So let me start by telling you about uh, the security of banking, and this is not, uh, you know, this is not research uh, that I've done in any way. I just want to tell you about uh, what Ross Anderson said in his wonderful book, Security Engineering, uh, that I highly recommend, and in particular his chapter number ten, uh, Banking and Bookkeeping. So it's a wonderful read. Ross, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, a huge figure in security, he spent many years working closely with banks uh, two decades ago when they were, uh, you know, initially setting up uh, their. Uh, crypto communications, other digital security systems, uh, etc. And he has a lot of knowledge that brings together a practical uh, knowledge in the field as well as his academic uh, security background. And what he says is what is uh, remarkable to me about this chapter of the book is that Anderson basically destroys the idea that banking security fundamentally relies on technological uh, preventive security mechanisms. And so even though you know banks at the time he was working with them, and, and certainly now, are in fact uh, uh, you know, uh, your money and banks, it, it is a digital system. But in spite of that, what he really emphasizes using so many anecdotes as well as uh, uh, you know, the knowledge that he gained from working with banks, that it's the processes and human procedures in place, as well as the detective and corrective uh, measures that banks are able to take, uh, that fundamentally guarantees the security of uh, uh, finances in the traditional banking system. Certainly, access controls and preventive security are a part of it, uh, but uh, as he uh, so well demonstrates, they're not the, the primary mechanism. And, uh, and I really recommend you to read that book chapter for, for the insight that he brings to that problem. So I want to start from that premise and sort of compare that to what we have in the Bitcoin world for the security of Bitcoins. So basically, what this can be summarized as is that banks, essentially, one of the things they have is an undo button. Right? Banking transactions are reversible. And if that turns out really to, to be the key to a lot of banking security, as well as the fact that you have the power of law enforcement at your disposal, it acts as a deterrent for malfeasors and so on. Yes, please. Does that undo button have to be hit within a few hours of a transaction, or you can hit it at any time? Ah, that's a great question. So from my understanding, this is part of the reason that there are humans in the loop in traditional uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 banking systems, and a transaction might take uh, uh, a couple of days to uh, fully process and so on, and so if you uh, hit that undo button within that period of time, then it's uh, much more effective than hitting it later. Uh, do you mean the insurance as a undo policy, or insurance is a separate thing? Insurance is a separate thing. I think it's also important, but here I'm primarily talking about the uh, reversibility of, uh, of uh, you know transactions in the banking system. Yes, and banks also do have preventive security. That is a one component, and you know all of these three things come together in the prevent, detect, and recover paradigm. However, I want to contrast this with the Bitcoin world when uh, we're faced with the fact that the only security mechanism available is a purely preventive one. Why? Because the security of your Bitcoins completely reduces to the security of your private keys, and so if those private keys are breached, if your device is stolen or, or if your machine is hacked into, then all, all of the Bitcoins controlled by those keys can be immediately and irreversibly and crucially uh, pseudonymously transferred uh, to the attacker's address, and so that poses a serious problem. These two mechanisms don't exist in the Bitcoin world. So this is the starting assumption for you know, a lot of the uh, Bitcoin security problems as well as solutions. In other words, one can say that every machine with Bitcoins is just basically a setting bug bounty, right? And it's, it's an automatic mechanism for claiming the reward as well. Uh, and, I, and I'll show you uh, a, a variety of examples of uh, uh, heist thefts and other losses in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So uh, in Bitcoin security, we are forced to accept the assumption that uh, uh, bringing bank-like security practices into Bitcoin uh, in, a, in a complete manner is unlikely. Certainly, we have a lot to learn from banks. There are auditing processes and so on. But uh, that entire security model is not going to translate over so well over here. So why why is it unlikely? Well, it's, uh, it's unlikely because we don't have an undo button, and uh, uh, you know law enforcement uh, has a much more difficult time with it because uh, uh, Bitcoin addresses don't have uh, names attached to them. So is it because it's hard to implement this undo button technologically in the cryptocurrency world, or why, why do you think? <coughs> 
because uh, the protocol is designed uh, uh, you know, to, be, to be a reverse. The current protocol. The current protocol, yeah. yeah. So I'm talking about the current Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, but still, you know, there are uh, billions of dollars worth of Bitcoins protected with this infrastructure, so it is something that uh, one has to deal with. So in essence, what I'm saying is that the reason that banks are secure is not primarily because they're really good at keeping attackers or even insiders uh, from getting to the credentials that control your money, but in fact, because they're really good at making sure that even if that adverse event happens, uh, then uh, not too much damage can happen. And let me give you uh, one uh, sort of uh, a numerical um, a view of just how, how strong this decision is. And this is uh, taken from this uh, great paper by these guys at uh, Microsoft Research, Nobody Sells Gold for the Price of Silver. Uh, and uh, here's one uh, sort of quote pulled from that paper. <coughs> they looked at one case study where uh, 40,000 financial accounts with a face value of $10 million are being sold on the underground market for an actual market value of only $500. And this is very typical. They go through example after example after example of the huge disparity between these two. And that's why it has the title, Nobody Sells Gold for the Price of Silver. And what one can conclude from all these examples is that uh, the value of uh, you know, breaching the access control uh, is not the face value of $10 million, but instead uh, there's a several orders of magnitude difference. So your ability to monetize on stolen credentials uh, you know, is, is far less than what those credentials are worth uh, in terms of face value. But crucially, this is not the case in terms of uh, in the case of Bitcoin, because if your server containing the private keys of $10 million worth of Bitcoins are reached, then that is worth exactly $10 million to the attacker, because they can instantly steal all those funds with, uh, uh, at least in the current system, pretty minimal risk, I want to say. Yes? Is this difference uh, in those numbers, uh, the difference between the the price that they sell to the to the attacker, or is it the the one that is incurred as a loss to the to the bank? So that five hundred is it the loss that is incurred by the account owner, or is it the the uh, one? Uh, so the, the five hundred and the way these data were generated is by infiltrating underground uh, uh, markets through IRC and so on, and looking at uh, the prices for which these credentials were being offered. And so the actual sale of uh, credentials worth uh, $10 million was completed uh, for, for the uh, price paid of $500. But for example, the, if the bank want to assess the, the, the damage, the loss, yeah. which of the number are the actual damage? Ah, um, right. Um, my guess is that it's closer to the latter number. I don't have a quantitative answer to that. I'm sure it exists in some papers. I'll be happy to go dig that up for you. But I have a qualitative view of looking at that a few, few slides later, if uh, that's OK. Yes? So there could be two different things going on here. One is that there's way too many hackers who are stealing these kinds of information and trying to sell them. And I'm trying to undercut your price. Right? You say I'm going to sell something sure. for 10 million for 5 million and sure. I say well I'll say it for 1000 bucks sure. because I have software that's going to keep hacking accounts and so I can sort of for free keep generating more and more accounts or it could be something that people are just very really hesitant to pay 1 million dollars and it's a high probability really caught. Th that's all definitely but true so. and, and what, what I'm trying to do here is not justify the exact number okay. of orders of magnitude difference between these two but simply point out a qualitative difference between uh, uh, you know, the security of financial accounts and the security of Bitcoin. Uh, so really, the, the assumption that uh, I want to get to uh, through these examples, again, in a qualitative sense, is that Bitcoin security starts off on the back foot. And in particular, software has never, as far as I know, uh, been the sole line of protection for money. And it's an important line of protection for sure, but not so far the sole line of protection. And this kind of gets back to the point that uh, uh, you were asking about. So if we want to try to see you know, how an attacker exploiting, for example, the Heartbleed bug, right, which is uh, one of the uh, most serious bugs uh, that uh, we've talked about in recent memory. Uh, but uh, exploiting that for financial gain is not that easy. And this is a little bit of, a, again, a simplified, uh, somewhat uh, uh, toy example. But uh, again, it's an illustration of a point. So let's say an attacker finds a server that's vulnerable to the Heartbleed bug, and they steal a lot of uh, credentials of people, specifically passwords. So step one is exploiting Heartbleed. Step one, uh, step two is stealing a lot of passwords uh, from the from the server. And I think this wordle is probably is from Lori's group. Michelle, you might not know. It's, it's, it's just generated a lot of beautiful visualizations of this sort. Okay, but you know that's not, that's not the end of the story. Uh, so they then have to use the. So presumably the reason there's a problem uh, is that even if this site 
website itself is not storing a lot of uh, uh, you know, financial information or whatever. People have reused passwords, so the uh, same user might be using it on other sites. So what the attacker then needs to do is uh, uh, make sure that they uh, exploit this user credential on some other site before the site owner notices this has happened, and installs a patch, and sends an email alerting all users uh, that their password has been compromised, and they might want to reset it on that site as well as other sites. So again, just an illustration of the point that even after a compromise, there are ways of recovering from that in, in the traditional system. And, and further, even if uh, that doesn't happen, uh, the user uh, on some other bank website uses the same password, hasn't changed that password, attacker tries to uh, go and uh, log in as that user using that pass password, what might happen? So uh, part of my research is on web privacy, and we've been looking at this empirically as well. A lot of bank websites uh, use uh, really neat security mechanisms, such as browser fingerprinting. They can collect a lot of uh, uh, behavioral details about your browser and use that to make sure that the person who's logging in now is the same person or is using the same device or browser uh, as logged in the previous time or when they made the account. And if that fails, then they might have a second factor using phone authentication or something like that. So again, all of these are practical security measures that are in place. They might not all exist at the same time in any given situation, but there are a lot of fallbacks in the real world. And finally, even if you succeed at all that, you have to contend with law enforcement because uh, identity uh, is pervasive in the traditional, traditional system, you know, IP addresses, ways of going after people, et cetera. So one final point I want to mention about the traditional model is that in addition to all of these multi-factor security, you also have another crucial thing, which is legal liability limitation. This is just one example of a liability limitation law that many of us are familiar with, right? Um, uh, I believe the way it works is uh, not liable for fraud over $50 if you report it within a certain time period, but even if you don't, uh, you're still liable for at most uh, $500 worth of fraud, if I remember the law correctly. Okay. So this is the traditional model. This is what basically, you know, uh, in addition to software security, uh, uh, all of these factors existing is what allows us to sleep at night with the traditional system. However, I want to argue that even though it enables uh, uh, good enough security in the real world, it has a lot of costs. Uh, I want to isolate three costs. One cost is that this cost of fraud, especially because of liability limitation, is sort of spread out as a tax uh, among all participants. And you know, you have your credit card fee of uh, uh, 25 cents or whatever it is, and you have a variety of other fees, and a big chunk of those fees are arising because the cost of all this fraud is spread out among all participants in the system. It's also slow because there are humans in the loop, as uh, you were asking about that a little bit earlier. Transactions take quite a while to complete. And also, limited innovation is a cost because uh, in the traditional system, you can't really, as a market, you know, establish a new type of uh, uh, service or market, whatever, before the government can come in and figure out how to regulate it, and you can set up appropriate trusted financial intermediaries who everybody can agree is, a, you know, is following those rules and is a good player in the system and so on. So I want to put a little bit of a cynical view on this traditional security situation. I want to claim that it breeds a cycle of mediocrity. What do I mean by that? Because the costs of security uh, are full of these externalities, as we call, call, call them in economics, in a lot of cases, other people are paying that cost, uh, and uh, particularly because of liability limitation, companies uh, and users really underinvest in preventive security in making sure that uh, you know, your open SSL infrastructure is free of bugs or uh, in a variety of other ways. And the reason you're able to get away with that is because you have uh, all of these other mechanisms in place and liability limitation, and, um, and, and, it's a, and it's a vicious cycle. And you sort of need that because software security is so bad, and if you didn't have all those other uh, sort of social safety nets, if you will, then things will just crumble, right? So how do we break out of this realm? That's the question that I want to ask. And I want to claim that it's possible that uh, there can be a new direction for breaking out of this that could come from the Bitcoin space. And to, to explain why this might be, let me show you this chart from one of the Bitcoin forums of uh, all the hacks that have taken place. So you know, th this is some uh, significant percentage, really, of all the uh, Bitcoins that have ever been generated, I think, have basically been uh, stolen at least once. And these numbers are orders of magnitude more than the sort of the fraud figures that you have in the traditional system. So if you look at the several hundred thousand uh, Bitcoins, and a Bitcoin today uh, trades for several hundred dollars, so we're really talking about very, very significant amounts of money. There was one study uh, that showed that of the about uh, 40 exchanges that they studied at the time, 18 had shut down. In many cases, it was because uh, the um, 
the uh, the owners uh, were thought to have run away with the funds, or the exchanges got hacked, and so on. So, it's been you know fraud has been very rampant in the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, partly because of software insecurity. So the community has uh, been forced to uh, develop ways to uh, be secure in spite of all of these problems. So one cool idea in the Bitcoin world is called uh, multi-signatures, and this is uh, you know uh, the traditional crypto idea of uh, um, uh, of splitting access control among uh, different devices, but it's uh, it's implemented in, in, in a different way in Bitcoin. Uh, what a multi-signature allows you to do is uh, tr uh, normally a Bitcoin address is associated with a single private key, single public private key pair. Instead, uh, the protocol allows you to associate an address with n different public and private keys, as well as specify some other threshold m. And the protocol ensures that M of these keys, whatever that threshold is, let's say three out of those five keys that you specified, have to together sign a transaction uh, in order to be able to spend the funds from that address. So that's really cool. So uh, you know, uh, very simply, we can have a, a two out of three system where uh, Elaine and I and Andrew together control a Bitcoin address, and some two of us have to decide to spend funds in order for that to be possible. And if uh, one of us is malicious, uh, they can't run away with the funds. Yeah. So what percentage of current Bitcoin transactions like in, in, in volume are currently protected that way? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, so I, I gave a talk recently where I presented the number and got it wrong and I was corrected in the Q&A. And uh, uh, from what I understand, it's about 8% and gradually growing. So this is still um, uh, new technology in the Bitcoin world. And so uh, if it is in fact 8% and growing, as I was told, then I think that's a very, um, a very positive number, uh, so I was pretty happy to hear that. So I, I have a slide talking about some drawbacks of multi-signatures, but uh, I don't want to get into that. I'll just keep that there in case uh, 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 somebody asks, is, are multi-signatures the perfect solution, or uh, are, do they have drawbacks? Sorry, but I, I, I just to understand you, I mean, are, yeah. you, are you actually claiming that the way to use, the best way to use them is to distribute them on multiple people, or ah. one person on multiple devices? Great, great question. Yes, I, I was uh, going to get to that, but uh, yeah. The, since, uh, since you asked that question. So conceptually, it's simple to think of them as distributed between uh, multiple people, but really they're, 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 there are two ways to use it, and uh, each of those ways, distributed between different devices of a single person or distributed between different people, I think are applicable in different scenarios. Uh, within a company, you might have uh, different employees actually sharing joint custody of funds held in long-term storage. But on the other hand, a, a very common use case is to have a two-factor Bitcoin wallet where one's funds are split uh, in control between one's computer and one's smartphone. And what happens here is you initiate a transaction from your computer, but then it has to be confirmed on your smartphone, and even if one of these two devices in, is infected with malware, uh, you're sure that the attacker can't steal the funds. So that would be a two out of two multi-signature. Then it's a question of usability. It's a question of usability, yeah. I'll actually uh, get to that in a second as well. So. Um, Multi-signatures have some drawbacks, but I don't want to uh, get, uh, get into that. So I don't want to do a comparison here, but I want to tell you that an alternative way uh, to do this is using threshold signatures. So multi-signatures, you know, conceptually you can think of it as splitting the access control, but it doesn't actually split a private key. It simply uses a feature of the protocol to specify that multiple independent private keys need to be used to sign. On the other hand, what threshold signatures do, this is sort of the traditional cryptographic solution, is to actually take a single private key and then to split it into different shares using secret sharing and, uh, um, uh, and put those different shares up on different devices or give it to different people and so on. So what this sentence is, is this is the, one of the drawbacks of multi-signatures that I was mentioning. It sort of forces you to broadcast your security policy to the entire world and there are a lot of uh, bad consequences of that. Anyway, uh, you know, either multi-signatures or threshold signatures I think are uh, much better than simply having a single point of failure and a single point of control. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, this is an alternate way to think about it. And so uh, what tre threshold signatures, in other words, allow you to do using secret sharing is m or more shares can reconstruct the key, but m minus one or fewer shares uh, provide no information whatsoever about the key. So uh, I have a question. I actually have a slide describing secret sharing. Is that going to be useful to anybody, or is that well known? Uh, uh, is that just like adding two elliptic curve points or something? 
Uh, uh, sort of. So it, it seems like there might be some use in very quickly going over it. Yeah. So let me show you secret sharing uh, sort of uh, visually here and, uh, and show you how you would take a private key and how you would split it into different shares in such a way that any M of them are going to allow you to reconstruct the key, but M minus one or fewer, no information about the key. I mean, that's intuitively tricky because I said no information. It's not simply a matter of you know partitioning the key into pieces, storing them on different devices. Because if you had M minus one of those pieces, it gives you a lot of information about the key. The adversary's task of figuring out that remaining piece is now much easier, right? <coughs> so it's not just that. So you need actually need linear algebra. But let me uh, show it to you in a very visual form here. So what you do is let's call S your secret, and you represent your secret as a point zero comma S on the y-axis. Yeah. It's going to be a very large, say, 128-bit integer. That's OK. Uh, this is just a, a, a conceptual representation. You know, what you want to do is you want to draw a, a line with a random slope through that point S. So this is your secret. And now you pick an arbitrary point on that line. And that becomes the first share that you assign to the first user of the first <coughs> device. You pick some other point on that line. That's the point for the second user of the second device. And you can keep doing this as many times as you want. So what is the property that we have? If an individual user here is malicious, they know that the secret corresponds to some line through their point. But since they don't know what slope that line has, it could be any line at all. And it's equally probable that any point <coughs> on the y-axis uh, could be the secret. So a single malicious user gains no information. On the other hand, any two users, right, since the line is determined by two points, can interpolate and reconstruct the secret. So what this basically gives you is two out of n secret sharing for any n. And you can increase your n at any point, just bring a new user into the system and assign them uh, a new point uh, at any, any time you want. So this is two out of n secret sharing. Uh, you might be able to see the pattern. So we use the line here because uh, it's a polynomial of degree 1. If you had an m, minus, an m out of n secret sharing, you would simply use a polynomial of degree m minus 1 and uh, use polynomial interpolation. So for 3 out of n, n secret sharing, you would do a parabola and so on. So this is uh, Shamir secret sharing. Uh, so this works very neatly. It allows you to uh, split a key into multiple pieces. Um, <laughs> and it also gives you, uh, uh, yeah, it, it also gives you the flexibility to use any access control policy you like. You can generalize beyond the amount of n. You can say, I want to have at least two employees and one manager sign off on a transaction in order to complete it. So it's pretty cool stuff. But you might be wondering, so in order to sign a transaction, though, you still need the private key, which means that you have to reconstruct the key in a single place. How do you actually sign a transaction without reconstructing the key? So this is called a threshold signature, and it's a very neat piece of crypto that allows you to actually construct the signature using an interactive protocol between those linear shares that you created without, in fact, reconstructing the key in a single place. So this is. Uh, part of the research that we did, we uh, came up with uh, the first uh, threshold signature scheme that is uh, compatible with the signatures that Bitcoin uses, uh, elliptic curve signatures. And uh, uh, this is our paper here. There's a bunch of at, at Princeton. We collaborated with uh, Rosario Gennaro, who's a cryptographer at uh, CCNY, and so on. So here, here was the cool experience that we had um, after doing this paper. We put this out there, and within a week, we were contacted by uh, three or four different developers of wallet software who were very eager to implement the system uh, in their software. And this is quite different from the system you traditionally have in crypto, right? where the research is way ahead of uh, where people are in practice. And you don't have that kind of existing sort of pent-up demand in the industry uh, to implement new crypto protocols. So that is very gratifying to see. And it's just an illustration <laughs> of the fact that since Bitcoin security starts so far on the back foot, there's really such a demand to use cutting edge crypto uh, in order to be better protect uh, uh, the security of Bitcoins because we don't have all of those fallbacks that we're used to in the traditional system. So you can see how this sort of acts as a spur for the development and deployment of new protocols. And when you start to implement them, you think about so many details that you never think of when, you, uh, you know, when you're just writing a paper. So it gives you a lot of very valuable practical knowledge uh, for improving security. So just to show you very quickly how our implementation works, we have a prototype uh, two-factor wallet. So what you do is uh, you would initiate a transaction on your computer, and it shows you the basic transaction details over here. And uh, uh, it would uh, you know, automatically pop up on your phone asking you for a confirmation. So all you have to do is hold them side by side and make sure that the transaction details that you see on one match uh, what you see on the other. 
And if they're the same, then you're assured that during this whole process, your computer could have been compromised by malware, and you're still safe. You're still not going to authorize a transaction that you didn't need to. So this is two out of two security. So crucially, uh, just a second, Elaine. Uh, crucially, after you confirm, there's going to be an interactive protocol between your phone and your computer passing messages back and forth, <laughs> constructing the signature for that transaction without reconstructing the key, and then broadcasting that onto the network. Sorry. Uh, so I just wanted to, so you, you raised that question in the beginning, like I said, I guess there are two uh, competing approaches. One is like you might want to design the system <coughs> such that it inherently has these uh, recovery and reversibility properties. You know, you may think about designing a uh, cryptocurrency that has these properties. Yeah. But of course, there's yeah. uh, costs associated with all, all of the recovery and reversibility. But on the other hand, you can think of designing a system that doesn't have <coughs> these, it's irreversible, um, but you add these extra, um, I, I guess, dimensions to, to achieve higher security and maybe also use things like insurance to maybe in some sense have as a replacement of uh -huh. the reversibility. So I, I thought you, you are going to kind of compare these two approaches. Like, uh, is, is the message that you think that the latter approach is better than the, the first one? Ah, um, so the message, and I have a slide about the message in a second, <coughs> but uh, the message basically is that uh, um, you know, we might design new cryptocurrencies, but for the cryptocurrencies we have now, we're in a purely preventive security model. And so this forces us to innovate within the preventive security model in terms of software security, new security models, and a bunch of things I'll mention in, a, in just a second. And these are going to have positive externalities because you can use these improved security mechanisms for other things like, for example, online voting and things like that, which we would love to be able to do, but we've never been able to because the uh, challenges in terms of software security and usable security are so high that uh, uh, we don't know if we're ever going to practically deploy such a system and get people to use it. So that's really the message. Bitcoin forces us to innovate, and that's going to have positive benefits even outside the cryptocurrency space for uh, security in general. So the Michelle, uh, sorry. So the message is not like basically trying to compare with these approaches, and I, I guess in, 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 in the end, like whichever is more economical uh -huh. will be the better solution. Yeah, so, so my uh, goal is not to do a comparison at all, and I, I know that you want to do a comparison, but I'm not going to do that, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. I think both approaches are going to exist side by side, but my message is slightly different. Michelle? So I'm just going to pick down for a minute. You, you, are you really asking people to compare those like 20, 20 character things next to each other? The same I think that's where your research comes in. So I actually had a grad student who was interested in solving that problem, so we do recognize that as a problem where we need to make some improvement, but I mean, you, you can see how you know it is a solvable problem oh, at least, sure. as opposed to the situation we were in like before. I said, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he came up with the approaches to you know uh, uh, transform a string into a series of pictures of cats and so on. But uh, uh, but you know, someone like you is in a much better position to know how to evaluate. The okay, um, so just to just to uh, you know uh, drill down on that message a bit, I really think that the innovations that are happening here could force us to think about new security models and new security architectures. Let me just pitch to you in two minutes uh, uh, one that uh, uh, my student and I have been thinking of. This is very early work. We don't have a paper or anything even close to that. But I just want to get you to think about this sort of uh, new security problem. Here's what I want to pitch. Forget about cryptocurrencies. Just think about having a web server and an associated database in a traditional you know, software security scenario, user is connecting over the web. I want to claim there is uh, uh, an interesting uh, security improvement to be achieved by using threshold cryptography in this fashion. I mean, uh, think about an analogy for a second. Whenever we want high availability or reliability, right, uh, from NASA and airplanes uh, to data centers, what we generally do is we try to have multiple redundant copies, but somehow we're not using that for security, where we want a combination of availability, integrity, and confidentiality, and maybe the system can give that to us. So let's say that whatever was your original system over here, you take that and you triplicate it, and you make these th uh, three copies. And each of them now has a copy of your asymmetric private key. And the user's over here, and they're going to send a message. But obviously, you don't want to change the web browser. So users still are sending a single message. They're not going to interact with three servers. So what do you do? You put an untrusted front-end server in the middle. Totally untrusted, just treat it as a man in the middle. That untrusted <coughs> server shouldn't see any confidential information. So user sends a message to the untrusted server. Uh, that untrusted server sends it to all of these three share servers. And each of these three share servers, they could be running OpenSSL or whatever. And they're going to execute, you know, uh, they're going to step through whatever OpenSSL is doing. Except 
when they get to the part where you think of this as the TLS handshake, and except when they get to the part where they're doing an asymmetric signature encryption step, we rip that out and we replace that with a module where these three uh, copies of OpenSSL are going to talk to each other and compute the resulting signature or encryption in a threshold fashion. And then they're going to send that back to the untrusted server. So what happens as a result of this is that the user establishes a TLS session with a virtual entity consisting of the threshold of these three entities. Right? And the untrusted server is just in the middle, and you still have this nice property that one of those this whole time could have been compromised uh, by an attacker, and still uh, you get some security properties out of it. Now, I want to go further and say that maybe there's a hope of doing this, not with three copies of OpenSSL, but maybe with three different TLS implementations. Uh, and that leads to some additional research challenges. I don't even know if it's doable. We're trying to see if it's even a, a potential interesting uh, research problem. Here are some of the uh, bottlenecks that you're going to run into. One is, how do you handle the non-determinism of these implementations? What do I mean by I don't mean a randomized cryptographic protocols. That we really know how to do. We have distributed random number generation. What I mean is, let's say that one implementation of your software uh, you know, returns a, a message to the user, and a different implementation returns the same message, but there's an extra space somewhere. Right? Protocols are not so precisely specified that they're byte by byte equivalents, and so you end up with slightly different messages, and you're trying to threshold sign them, and then the threshold signing protocol doesn't work. So that's one problem, and there's another problem with avoiding multiple copies of databases. So it's a totally open research question, but at least it's the new direction that's come out of uh, uh, cryptocurrency research for how to improve software security in general. And so here's another one, and I think uh, Michelle will enjoy this in particular. Uh, so forcing people to keep their Bitcoin secure has been resulting in a lot of uh, improvements in user education out of complete necessity. So right now, you know how insecure our passwords are, and we're able to get away with that because of all those additional security uh, me measures that I talked about. It doesn't cut it in the Bitcoin space. Uh, both, uh, you know, how you protect your keys is very different from how you protect your, uh, you know, your credentials stored on your computer, as well as a more direct comparison is Bitcoin has something called the Brain Wallet. And this is pretty cool. What's a Brain Wallet? A Brain Wallet is a system by which you just have a passphrase stored in memory. And, as long, and, and you go to any computer with the, uh, with the Brain Wallet software and you type in that passphrase and it's able to recreate your entire set of uh, private keys just using one passphrase. It's a deterministic protocol. So this exists, exists and it's deployed. But think about a user using a Brain Wallet with an insecure passphrase. And by insecure passphrase, I mean anything, anything less than 64 bits of entropy. So that's far more than we ask for even security conscious users with your typical Gmail or whatever. So if they're using a brain wallet with an insecure passphrase, what's going to happen is uh, they're going to receive bitcoins at those addresses generated using that insecure passphrase. Right? And so what this means is that these bitcoins are going to be sitting on the blockchain at an address with the property that anybody can try to brute force uh, you know, some list of passphrases. And as soon as they guess that particular user's weak passphrase, they're going to match it to that public address that's out there without, in fact, knowing or caring about which user they're attacking. So this makes the equation you know, much more beneficial for the attacker. So again, we see this huge asymmetry between Bitcoin security and the traditional security model. Assaulting all that, forget about it. Right? Uh, attackers can simultaneously attack every brain wallet passphrase instance that simultaneously and uh, that's ever been used. And in fact, there are attackers doing this. If you use a weak password, I guarantee you, your Bitcoins are going to get stolen within some three seconds or five seconds or something like that. Uh, some people match with that. So uh, you know, that's a problem. So you really need password security that can, in fact, resist offline brute force cracking attempts. So I think if Bitcoins become mainstream, you know, it's going to force us to, to make a lot of improvements in user education, both in passwords and handling our keys and so on. Okay, so, so this is sort of the message for security that I have from, uh, uh, from what we've learned uh, from Bitcoin, right? So I think it's going to lead to improved software security. Firms are going to realize that it's uh, easier for them to throw some money toward improving OpenSSL security than dealing with the implications of it. Currently, you don't have that problem, again, because of the safety net, not to the same extent. Uh, it's going to lead to new security technologies. Uh, I pitched one, and I, I don't know if uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's going to become a real system, but uh, something like that is possible. New security models. This is pretty cool. Uh, there are companies offering security as a service. This is, again, something that's possible in Bitcoin. Hasn't quite been done, as far as I know, uh, outside Bitcoin. So what this is, is you can have this kind of two out of two security. 
and you hold on to one of those shares of the key, and this uh, external company, you just outsource the other key to them. And so it's two out of two, so they can't steal your funds, but at the same time, you can put limits on your spending, such as no more than $100 per day. And what happens is that uh, since uh, you know, they need to sign up as well, they'll sign up on anything less than $100 per day, but if it's more than that, they'll give you a phone call and they'll authenticate you on the phone and uh, they'll confirm that. So this is a little bit of a hybrid model of bringing humans into the loop, as well as this uh, underlying automated irreversible payment mechanism. So it's a lot of innovation that you know, has become possible due to this new model, and again, finally, user education. Okay. I spent a lot, yeah, John. I'm just curious, I mean, you, uh, you know, I agree, it's, and it's interesting that you have these potential positive uh, externalities, but the flip side is that you might get decreased usage of Bitcoin, right? So once somebody tries it and gets burned, they may just give up altogether. That's definitely true, and in fact, I think one of the major reasons why adoption among mainstream consumers, at least so far, has been uh, uh, far less than uh, what it traditionally been thought is uh, precisely for those reasons. It's because the place where software security is now is simply not enough for us to uh, be comfortable with, uh, uh, with you know, using Bitcoins for everyday things and relying on our own security expertise. But if you look at the trajectory, uh, there has been so much interest in improving, improving that situation that uh, we, we're already seeing a lot of these in, in play. And so I was hoping that this would become true two years ago, but I could not give that talk then. And since then, we've seen a lot of the evidence that this is in fact happening. So, so this is also like uh, like for cash, like you use cash to do small dollar transactions, but if you want to transfer a million dollars, you probably yeah. use the bank to get a better uh, spot and protecting it. Yeah. So, so do you think like something like Bitcoin, if uh, it doesn't give you this kind, it's kind of like cash, if it has this irreversibility right. thing, so, so do you think this is more going to be like for these uh, usage patterns like cash, like small dollar transactions? I think it's possible, and you know, right now, as you know, there are many uh, hurdles like block size limits and so on. But it's uh, possible that in the future we might be able to overcome. Do you think, like people talk about these um, various exciting applications on top of Bitcoin, like do you think to support these bigger applications like smart contracts, we need a better underlying cryptocurrency that maybe support better irre irre irreversibility? I'm going to take that one offline. How about that? We, you and I can have a very long discussion about that. Okay, um, uh, if I may make a suggestion, let me uh, give you a few points about game theory to think about because I don't want you to go away from this talk thinking this is only about security. I think uh, it brings together a lot of uh, different things from uh, different areas of computer science and, and game theory and mechanism design and so on. And then I'll make sure to leave uh, time at the end for questions as well. Okay. So one argument that I want to, uh, one claim that I want to make and defend, even though not everybody in the Bitcoin community believes this, but I want to change their minds, is that Bitcoin stability is fundamentally a game theoretic proposition. So uh, Satoshi, in his original paper, did talk about incentives. However, his security argument for Bitcoin uh, took a distributed systems view in which you assume that 51% of nodes are uh, compliant. And I'm using the word compliance deliberately instead of honest. I really dislike that word. I think the word honest is, uh, uh, it, it sort of clouds our thinking uh, because uh, it, you know it, it sort of brings in uh, factors that we don't want to be thinking about. We want to be thinking about all nodes as acting according to their incentives. And let me explain why. So where did this model come out of? It came out of a uh, distributed systems world where you have a lot of machines and an attacker could be compromising some of them. If you wanted your overall system to be still secure and you made an assumption that you could, uh, for example, uh, detect that compromise and patch it before the attacker got to 50% of your machines or some large fraction of those machines and you still wanted to prove the system secure. Right? So the goal there was not to get so hung up on the 50% number or the one third number or whatever, but just to say as long as too many machines are not compromised, you're still okay. Now, if you try to move those assumptions over to the Bitcoin world, uh, those assumptions fare actually quite poorly because who are the players in this distributed system we're talking about? They're the miners. They have enormous economic incentives that they do in fact respond to. You know, they're very sensitive to the uh, uh, fluctuations in the Bitcoin market price and the price of mining hardware and the hash rate and so on. So they are economically rational actors, or uh, to a certain degree, they're, they're rational actors. We know that. So, what is the reason to assume that any miner is going to be compliant is simply going to follow the details that are specified in the protocol, uh, and let alone 51% of miners? So I find this, uh, this kind of uh, security argument for Bitcoin to be really lacking. Instead, the type of question we should ask is the game theory view, which is that if all the miners start off in a state where everybody is compliant and following the protocol, you want to prove that that's a Nash equilibrium. 
You want to prove that for any miner, it's not a good strategy to deviate from the protocol. You have to assume that every miner is self-interested. That's the only way you can have real confidence in the security of Bitcoin, not by picking some arbitrary number and sort of treating it as magical. Yeah. So that's one view I want to give you. And there are some objections to this view. Uh, people might say, wait, but miners are on game theories. They're not, you know, they're not thinking things. So my answer to that is think about where game theory has been applied for analyzing the prisoner's dilemma, and even for traditional things like hawks and doves. And certainly hawks, doves, and prisoners are also not game theorists either, but that doesn't mean game theory is any less applicable. So the applicability of game theory does not come with the assumption that miners are explicitly doing game theory the calculations in their hands. Uh, just like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the efficient market hypothesis or whatever, it doesn't mean that uh, everybody who's investing in stocks has read uh, Adam Smith's book or whatever. So similarly for game theory. Most prisoners who are facing a dilemma have never heard of the term prisoner's dilemma, but that's okay. We still use game theory to analyze their behavior. So that's not an objection. There is, though, a slightly more sophisticated version of this objection, which is deviating is hard. So this is something you might hear often. Oh, we don't really have the software tools that have been developed for miners to easily code and execute alternative strategies. And I want to argue that this gets the cause and effect exactly backwards. I want to argue that because people have not so far seen a great uh, financial benefit to deviating from the protocol, there has not been a sufficient incentive to develop those uh, uh, software and tools for miners. And there's one more objection, which is that, uh, oh, but if miners try to deviate from the protocol, that'll be uh, uh, seen as a really bad thing for the Bitcoin ecosystem, and so the exchange rate will tank, people's confidence in Bitcoin will drop, and miners who own Bitcoins will see the value of those Bitcoins <coughs> uh, depreciate a lot, and so this is a tremendous disincentive for miners to uh, employ deviant strategies, therefore we cannot use game theory to analyze the behavior of the miners. So this is a very frequent argument that is preferred, and I will address this. This is a somewhat valid argument, but but I'll give you an answer to this. So here's, here's the thing I want to tell you, though, about game theory. Computer scientists often design mechanisms, right? Online ad options and ad routing and so on. And these situations have some things in common. Uh, there are a large number of players who can come and go. There are no identities. There are ad hoc protocols and so on. So anything, you know, uh, so, and this situation is, again, very similar to cryptocurrencies. And anything we can learn from game theory and mechanism design in Bitcoin uh, will apply in a pretty big way uh, to a lot of these other systems. So I was going to go through some examples, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, what I will quickly tell you is that in some fairly simple formal game theoretic models of uh, Bitcoin miner behavior that have been analyzed and studied for many years, it turns out there have been some really stunningly simple examples of deviant strategies that are uh, possible, that are profitable for miners. And the simplest one of these examples, so I won't go through the math of this, it turns out that there are, there are two mining pools, and if you don't know what mining pools are, just think of there are two miners, and one of those mining pools devotes part of its energies to becoming part of the other mining pool, uh, uh, and then executing a certain kind of attack, uh, it can obtain uh, higher than its share uh, of mining rewards. So this is extremely simple. If I had two more minutes, I could just go through the slide and explain it to you. But it took about five years of people thinking about this problem to basically work out the math that's on this slide. It's just a bunch of arithmetic, just calculating some fractions. And nobody noticed this for five years. Okay. I was going to give you another example that I'll again, and this is uh, finally the paper that talked about it. I'll again um, uh, skip this example. This is called a feather fork. Again, really simple. Andrew explained this in two paragraphs in a, in a blog post. Again, people have never noticed this. This is another way to deviate from the protocol. Uh, another one, uh, Joe Bonneau uh, came up with a way to bribe miners using the Bitcoin mechanism itself to incentivize them to deviate from the protocol. Again, not noticed for several years, even though it's kind of obvious in retrospect. So what I want to claim is, we have fairly simple formal models that we've written down. Forget the question of whether or not that model is a good enough approximation to reality. Even you know, just working within that model, there are some very obvious bugs, if you want to call it that. But we didn't find it for several years. And this is really, really strange. These, are, these examples that I went through are some of the most shocking things to me about Bitcoin, how obvious in retrospect they are once they've been published, and how long it took for people to find them, even though they had been looking for those examples. So I want to say, look how far software testing has come, you know, uh, automated ways to find bugs and so on. Can we automate the finding of these deviant strategies? 
I think it's entirely possible that we can uh, uh, build a testing framework in which these automated, uh, these deviant strategies could have been autom automatically explored in time. And I want to uh, make one final observation about game theory, and this brings, back, brings us back to the question of the objection where people say, oh, miners won't execute these deviant strategies because the Bitcoin exchange rate will fall. To which I say, what these people are saying in the language of game theory is that there are two games going on. There is a high-level game in which miners observe what is going on in the Bitcoin ecosystem and carry out game theoretic actions such as buying or selling Bitcoins. And then nested within that game is a low-level game that is played by automated software agents that, that is deciding whether or not to participate in the Bitcoin protocol on, uh, in a compliant manner or deviate and so on. So this nested game structure, I want to claim, comes up all over the place, but yet we've never noticed it and formally defined it in it. And I think if we do that, that can lead to a lot of insights. So there are literally zero papers uh, that have, uh, in, in Bitcoin certainly, that have looked at this nested game structure, and yet it comes up everywhere. Uh, you know, malware adopting, uh, adapting uh, to any virus, so that's one game. At a high level, there's the game of malware authors at a human level, looking at and responding to the actions of the creators of antivirus. So the reason that these are two different layers is that they operate on entirely different time scales. The inner game operates at a time scale of minutes. You look at a block, you, you decide whether to mine on top of the block or move to a new block. Okay. Whereas the game where the human operators of the system notice that something has gone wrong and decide to do something, th those have actually happened in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Some of you may know about the version 0.7 to version 0.8 port. That bumped up the level of the game from the inner level to the outer level, and uh, the group of core developers had to respond and roll out a patch and so on. That operates at a time scale of a few hours. So this nested game structure, I think, is crucial to analyzing Bitcoin, as well as a variety of other uh, mechanisms designed by computer scientists where there are humans operating slowly, and there are software agents that they create operating on a time scale of minutes. It comes up over and over again. I found exactly one paper on this from uh, 1988, I think, is uh, talking about uh, uh, these nested or two-level games in a totally different context. They talk about, uh, you have uh, 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 the game of diplomacy where different countries interact with each other at an, at an international level to score points in some sense, but there are domestic voters who are playing a game at a different level to vote them into or out of office. So anyway, so I wanted to give you the fact that uh, uh, you know, in Bitcoin and game theory, if we can automate the analysis of well-specified games as well as formally define and analyze nested games, uh, we can make a lot of progress. And I was going to say a couple of things about uh, reusable ideas from Bitcoin, but in the interest of time, I'll actually stop and take questions. Total silence. Yeah. <laughs> Blow your minds. Just joking. Well, I'm yeah. curious about, about this. Um, I forget the name of the paper. The AL paper you just put up before. Yes, Miner's Dilemma. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it, it, so that showed that there was a potential attack. But was there any evidence, or is there any any evidence today that people are actually carrying out that attack? Ah, that's and, a great and, question. And if not, then it's something about the model, right? Absolutely. Yes. Oh. Yes. The, I think this is a very important issue. So far, the only attacks we've seen people carry out are uh, DOS attacks against mining pools. And so I think it's an important question of asking why uh, these attacks have not been carried out. And the most frequent response to that is the one about the exchange rate, which is what brings me to my point about nested games. No, but, but I mean, it, it should be the case that the minute this paper hit the web, everyone should have gone and, and, tried and done this strategy. Uh, I mean, I don't think people, well, I, I mean, it's hard to say that people did not carry out the strategy because they were worried about what's going to happen to the exchange rate. Right, because if only I deviate and nobody else does, the exchange rate won't, won't go down. It's reasonable. It's a reasonable claim that the exchange rate will go down in response to, uh, you know, uh, uh, so this would be a highly observable event, sorry, if, if somebody did this. Really? If one person did it, it would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, and the reason for that is... Yeah, because it requires the whole pool to change. No, but it's only a small fraction of the people in the pool, right? Uh, so if you have a fraction alpha of, uh, of mining power, then the gain you're going to get over your expected amount is alpha squared. Right? So it doesn't become profitable until high fractions of the... And it's similar for uh, other attacks, for the selfish mining attack as well. You have exactly the same phenomenon. It's only going to be profitable. small pools could carry it out without, without being noticed for, for a little while, right? So what needs to happen here is the reason this is grayed out is that 25% of mining power in this example goes dark, to gain, uh, what is this, uh, one, uh, one half minus five over nine, so five percent of uh, extra 
uh, mining reward. So uh, the detectability compared to the profit you're going to make is, is just huge. And uh, in general, it's, I don't think anybody's suggesting that these attacks can be carried out in an undetectable fashion. But it's a great question. Yes, you think the denial of service attacks are happening so that other miners can benefit from the decrease in mining? Power? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So then, I mean, but then I didn't understand your point about the, um, you know, what about the effect of the long-term decrease in the exchange rate. I mean, I mean, you, you said we have to analyze it, but what's your gut feeling about what's going on there? That that, that, that that's why people are, are are not doing it because they're concerned about. I can think of several potential reasons. That is one concern. Um, let's see. Uh, another concern could be that. Uh, uh, in, in mining pools, uh, the problem of collusion is uh, uh, far difficult in, in practice than it's uh, often been suggested. Uh, so those would be the two primary things that I would raise. There could be other factors too. I mean, I guess game theory doesn't do so well with talking about coalitions and how they, how you might deviate within the coalition itself and things like that. Right. So, but yeah, but one thing I want to stress is that uh, you know er everything that I've shown on this slide. Uh, is we're talking about the question of why are we not seeing this attack in practice. So this was posed uh, by Gavin, for example, by Gavin and Houston, uh, as an important question to consider. You know, within this framework, or, uh, is this attack profitable or not? And for many years, people didn't, didn't find the book, and that, that is just shocking to me. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'll stick around for a little bit, uh, certainly to take questions offline as well.